Hello and welcome to Inside Intercom. I'm Liam Geraghty. Advances in AI and automation are reshaping customer service, and keeping up is critical to any support team's success. And if there's one question that's been on the top of every support leader's mind recently, it's how do you prepare your support team for AI? Well, on today's episode, we attempt to answer that very question. We'll be joined by Declan Ivory, VP of Customer Support at Intercom, Rati Zirawa, Senior Group Product Manager at Intercom, and Geronimo Chala, Chief Client Officer at Rebag. They are going to explore how support leaders should prepare their teams as well as preparing customers for interacting with AI, not to mention ensuring your knowledge base is ready for AI bots like Finn. To begin with, it is no secret that customer service and customer support teams are going through drastic changes at the moment. So to talk about how the landscape is changing, here's Declan Ivory, VP of Customer Support at Intercom. I think one of the big shifts at the moment is around the ability to really take AI and apply it in a very meaningful way from a customer service point of view. Like some of the technology changes have been phenomenal over the last few months. But does it have implications for the team? For example, the things that I've been trying to keep front of mind is be very clear about your strategy for AI. So be open and transparent about the drivers and the goals with the team. So, you know, it does have impact on the team, you know, in terms of how they're going to work in the future, what type of work comes into them. So be very open, very upfront, be clear about the strategy for AI with the team and get them engaged very early on in, in understanding what you're trying to achieve at, at the business. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, AI is just a component of, of what you use to deliver support. And it's really around how AI will complement the human support experience that ultimately gives the most compelling experience for your customers. Also, acknowledge that things will change. Like, you know, this kind of technological advance is not without some changes. And involve the support team in planning the changes ahead. They ultimately know your customers better than anyone else. So it's really important to listen to your team and help them shape the ultimate way that you're going to deliver AI. Because they, they, they know better how AI is going to work for your customers than anyone else in your organization. So listen to your team is the second big consideration. Thirdly, communicate early, as I've kind of mentioned, like bring people in early and often, you know, because this is quite a dynamic environment. We're all learning as we go around exactly how AI can be applied. Technologies like Finn are really opening up new opportunities around how you think about the customer journey. Like make sure you're communicating all of the changes that are happening very early on in the process and make sure that you keep your team well informed. And then the other kind of really critical thing is, you know, be very clear about the opportunities that a move to an AI powered support model presents for the team. Less mundane work coming in, new skills required so people can hone their troubleshooting skills, product knowledge skills. New roles are emerging as well in the space, which we'll probably touch on later on. And ultimately, you're delivering more fulfilling work for the team. They can actually be more consultative with their customers. They can actually spend more time solving complex problems. Geronimo Chala is Chief Client Officer at Rebag, a website and app where you can buy, sell and trade luxury accessories, including handbags and watches. And Geronimo, like everyone in CS at the minute, is in the thick of it. Yeah, I think, you know, really kind of acknowledging that this change is actually coming is, was the first step that we took. And I think really when we embrace AI, right, it's not only about the technology, right? It's about how the organization is set up to really actually partner with this technology and really use it to its maximum advantages. And so when we think about organizational changing and kind of like just updating kind of our org to really actually manifest implementation, but then also management of tools within the technology, we've got to think about, is this going to require new roles? Is this going to require, you know, just a different type of shift in what we naturally were doing? So when we take a look at, for example, CS agents, now that this allows us to be a bit more streamlined or a bit more cater to a personalized experience, right? How does the CS role change, right? How does it actually evolve, right? And so support is not necessarily going away. This is not replacing human support or touch, right? This is just adding efficiencies, faster responses so that we can actually spend our time really catering what the future is going to be for that individual on that next time around on our site or, you know, the next time that they visit one of our locations. So really kind of understanding how that structure is going to look is really important to that. So that one, you can manage the technology appropriately, gather the insights, right? So when we look at some of these roles, you know, human behavior, right? 
AI is going to give us a lot of in-depth knowledge if actually managed properly on human behavior, right? Whether that's the type of questions that are coming in, how the questions are coming in, the tone of voice in that interaction, how is that impacting MPS, CSAT, right? And how do we take this information really and disperse it between departments that are going to need this information by using summarization tools that AI is already offering to really actually provide that next level future support. So I think a lot of it has to do with organizational change, change of mindset, right? Which is changing that strategy mindset a bit so that you can really actually embrace this new bit of technology that's really going to transform really amazing experiences that customers are going to be able to have. Yeah. And that reminds me of something Ruth O'Brien, Intercom's Director of Customer Support, always says, and that's how AI is helping us get more time for the humans to spend with customers and go the extra mile for them. And the more AI can take care of the more transactional back and forths, when a customer does land with a human, it can be a really exceptional experience. Yeah, and it's refreshing, right? You know, when you think about it, uh, I think one of the most common things that you're is like, oh, we're so tired of answering the same questions over and over. And But this really yeah. kind of unlocks, you know, this creative kind of partnership, right? You know, let the AI kind of do the day-to-day stuff and let us kind of spend a little bit more time outside of the box with this particular customer, whether it's solving complex situations, but at the same time too, really providing, again, what that relationship is going to be on a one-to-one basis with that agent in the future. Ratty, Ratty's our senior group product manager at Intercom. Ratty, what's it like from your vantage point? It's been interesting with talking to customers and how Finn and AI fits in the picture. And it's really, we always talk about this at Intercom, but it's also been true with our customers in terms of how the human and AI is working together. And particularly in picking up from what Geronimo was talking about there on needing to have um, the right content is super important. So within your teams, needing to have people that are product experts and content experts becomes really critical. I think for a long time with help centers, we've looked at things like views and hoping that customers go there. Maybe your agents are sending that content. But we're now seeing that there's a tighter loop of feedback where the human is extremely important to help identify those gaps in content. The experts in the product that you have, but also in the right way to shape that content so that AI can be quite powerful. So it becomes this really interesting interaction. I remember I used to work in a frontline role as well. I think another change that we're seeing is a lot of times you get a lot of repetitive and simple questions. And seeing that shift where teammates now are having to spend time on more complex questions. And we actually see that complex questions are what you want to have your humans handle. And even some end users don't want to talk to a human for simple questions. They expect that to be handled more with their self-serve. And so this is the shift we're starting to see in the market. Roles in support teams and particularly new roles that might come up as a result of AI is also important to talk about at the minute. Declan, what do you think about the new types of roles that we'll see emerge as a result of all this change? I think this is a really exciting aspect of what's happening today because you've got to think differently, I think, about how you engage with your customers. A very simple thing, you've got to look at the customer flow from start to finish. You've got to be very intentional about how you design it. And for that, like you need new roles. So as an example, like we've recently hired in what we call a conversational designer or conversation designer so to really look at what is it like from the customer perspective as they go through an AI flow, maybe into a human flow, maybe back to an AI flow as well as, as part of that overall journey and making sure that it's seamless, that it feels integrated, that the customer feels that they're valued throughout the, the entirety of that journey. That's one example of a role or, you know, we touched on already, touched on the, the need for knowledge management. So it may not be a specific role itself, but a skill that we need to develop across the team is this ability to really think about what's the knowledge that we need to now provide to our automation layer or to FIN and, and really make sure that's tuned and optimized to deliver for customers. That's another kind of skill set. Or another thing that people talk about is the whole idea of prompt engineering. Like how do you find a mechanism or approach to actually allow your customers to engage with, with FIN and the automation layer in the most effective way possible so that they're getting the best out of it. So again, that's just an, a, another role that, that's kind of coming to the fore and another way that we look at our organization structure. Yeah, and at Intercom, we have a help center manager and a conversation designer, and there's so much work for them to do. And we have the wider support team jumping in to help them as well. So there's just so much of this new type of work happening at the moment. So it's really exciting to see these new roles and titles as well. Yeah, I think because the power that really is coming behind AI and the capabilities it has, you know, I think it kind of extends itself a little bit more and it transforms this kind of world of CS that we were naturally 
used to, which was, you know, hey, you call us in or you email us in or you chat us in to, you know, solve your problems, right? We're looking at it a, a little bit different. This is actually enabling us to really actually create a world of sales and enabling this kind of like really personalized experience. In order to do that, right, some of the rules that we are kind of toying and thinking about, right, is someone who's a behavioral analyst, right? Someone who really actually understands the behaviors that are coming in and the type of questions, what are the hidden contents or what are the hidden means behind that question that's coming in through that AI chat? Really analyzing that and saying, hey, you know what? There's a need for this type of you know, social media engagement, right? Because you know, a lot of people are showing us that they're more visual learners, right? So how do we actually start integrating some visual stuff so that that's going to help us improve our following on our social media omni channels, right? I think, you know, another one that's really important, right, is this world of content manager that has always sat in the marketing world, right? Now it's probably going to start shifting a little bit more onto the, the CS side of world, right? You know, the, the sales side of world and, and really understanding that hybrid of, you know, how do I leverage this technology to help me build content? You know, how do I take summarization, right? Because one of the interesting stats that we do see that's out there, user-generated content, which if you think about it, every chat that comes in is basically user-generated content, right? Actually builds stronger loyalty to brand. It it actually influences about 68% of the purchase of a consumer. So when you really think about, you know, how someone's taking that, right, and really leveraging the content, right, and then helping us kind of really actually create the right content, it really changes that role. So I think the combination of someone who really understands consumer behaviors is able to analyze what that is doing. And then at the same time, someone who's able to generate that content, keep it fresh, keep it rotating, you know, so that the AI ch- channels can really actually latch onto it and, and, and use that as a source of means to point people into the right direction, I think is kind of one of these two kind of important roles that really are going to impact how we can leverage this from a sales perspective, not only from a support pers- perspective. Rati, you've been speaking to a ton of our customers about AI. So what are they saying about this? Yeah, that's been interesting. And I think it, it ties into exactly what Declan and Geronimo are covering. I think very quickly, it's been a mix. One is definitely this understanding the intermediate acknowledgement of needing space for someone who manages the content and thinks about the content. Um, I think for a long time, a lot of support teams have wanted to have space. We're trying to balance, how do I make space to create content and update it? I can see the potential value of it, but the tension with having the high volumes within your team that you need to handle the inbound. And ultimately that's what takes up a lot of that time. And so I think really tied into what Declan Geronimo was saying here is starting to see almost this like very obvious way where an AI does show an immediate return on investment. When you start improving your content, you see that that's able to serve your end users. And how do you make space is the question of like, how do you make space and room for your teammates on the job being able to contribute to that inbound content and things like, I know I used to use text expander a lot. And even though you have like shared macros and guru cards, people have their own sort of ways of communicating content hidden in different places. How do you make sure that they can fit, feed that into your AI and educate it? So it really is around this role of someone who knows the product really well, but also um, is helping to improve the content either centrally or as part of their role day to day. Okay, so we've spoken about preparing our teams for AI, but let's switch how to prepare customers for AI. There's a theory in the industry right now around, do you let your customers know that they're speaking to a bot or do you pretend they're human? Geronimo, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's definitely that debate out there. You know, do we let them know? Do we not? And it's really funny. I always kind of share this kind of thought process, right? You know, Back in the days before AI really existed and we were dealing with just regular, you know, kind of chatbots, we were like, well, don't let them know that it's a chatbot. We, you know, that's like, oh, the stigma is just horrible. And then now since AI is around, they're like, well, should we let them know now? And I think, you know, really the approach and the thought process behind it is, is that people are coming to our site, right, and experiencing our site to get quick responses, to get an answer, right? They want speed, efficiency, and in all reality, a great experience, right? That really replicates, you know, how much either they've spent with our brand or, you know, how much time and how many times are they kind of coming back to our brand. And so that kind of level of necessarily having to introduce a bot is really something that we don't necessarily think that we have to, because I think it's already there, right? 
the AI capabilities in the bot, right, is an extension of our team. We look at the bot as an extension of our team, right? This is an additional employee that we have. It's just not a physical employee, but it's an additional helping hand that's out there, right? And so what we do see is that customers are coming to the site. They want a quick answer. And I think when that handoff begins to happen, right, I think it's comforting for them to know like, oh, well, someone is still here to actually help continue any deeper questions or complex questions that maybe the bot can't have, right? So I think that level of preparation and being able to hand that off and setting up the handoff, right? How do you actually set up the correct channel, right? Where the AI is going to be handing off that conversation to, I think is important, right? I think that's more important than really actually introducing like, hey, you're speaking to an automated bot more so, hey, you're here, you're going to get really fast support, you're going to get efficient support, right? And you're going to get handed off if needed to someone uh, personally. So I think this kind of balance is really the important matter when introducing the conversation. Declan, can you tell us a little bit more about how customers should position a product like Finn, if they're going to be using it front and center in the messenger? How do you think they should be speaking to their customers about this? So I think a lot of it is around being very transparent with your customers that you're using a technology solution, but it's complementing or augmenting the human support experience rather than replacing it and really making sure that you, you, your customers are, are very clear about that. And the intent is to drive a more positive customer experience because ultimately you know, we've talked about the fact that it can answer questions instantaneously. So it's, it's actually driving a much better customer experience at the end of the day. I think we should be transparent about that. And it's really augmenting the human support side. In terms of preparing customers also, you know, we have an obligation to be and I mentioned this earlier, being very intentional about the customer journey, really look at it from the customer perspective. How are they going to interact with this kind of new way of providing answers to them or giving them service? And make sure that it is seamless. You mentioned already, Ruth and Geronimo mentioned, it's a seamless handoff. You know, All of the context that has been gathered already in the conversation must be available as the handoff goes to a human support agent, that it is seamless. You know, Customers feel they're being valued through the process. I think we all know the worst thing is that you it's a very clunky experience. You feel you're being handed off and you're starting again going through your problem. And that's where I think the key thing and you know, assure customers that that's really what you're aiming for. It's a very, very kind of seamless journey, seamless experience for them. I think measuring the customer experience is really, really important as well. You know, trying to understand what has worked well from the customer perspective, what what hasn't worked well, and constantly tuning. You know, this is not a kind of a, a one and done type environment. You enable it, you learn all the time, you tune. And I think that's one of the things we need to build up trust with customers that we're hearing and understanding the experience they have and tuning it all the time and, and, and making it better. And also, as I kind of mentioned earlier, also finding ways of educating our customers around how to engage with this technology in the best way to make it most effective for them. Like there are ways of phrasing questions that will ultimately allow the technology to deliver answers in, in a much speedier way and a, and a more effective way. And we've got to find ways of subtly prompting our customers to ask the questions in the right way. I think that's all part of how we think about the customer experience and preparing our customers for this technology. Ratty, I'd love to hear what you think, because you would have had a lot to work on in terms of making sure we're using the right words and the right terms. Definitely. I I might even start with almost the state of the world before we've had AI chatbots. I think for a long time, a lot of end users have experienced bad bots. And what I mean by that is like almost you'd ask a question in your natural language of how do I log in? Different bots would give you different answers that weren't quite relevant to you. And in fact, how that changed end user behaviors to start interacting with bots by using keywords. It's like log in help (laughs) or starting to use keywords to interact. And what we've noticed with a lot of customers is they start to learn end users that when you're interacting with the AI bot, you can use more natural language and you can trust that you'll get better responses from it. And there's been an interesting journey with some of our customers seeing how initially some of their end users would start interacting by using keywords. And it's almost needing to train the end users like, hey, you can actually trust this AI bot because you can use your full sentence, you can use your full language, it will help you disambiguate, which Finn is really good at when a customer asks a question and needs a bit of clarification, which is so different than the previous bots that we've had in the market. And so really having that distinction or understanding of AI bots, I think is helpful for end users. They know how to interact with this bot and they tend to have a higher expectation end users because they know that it can understand what I'm saying. It would tend to give me a, a better answer if it knows. And then also there's a seamless handover, if, at least if you're using with Finn, seamless handover to go to human if you need to. 
Okay, let's shift gears a little bit to talk about how to prepare your help center or your knowledge base to be as optimized as they can to work with AI. So we have come up with six relatively simple steps to do this. The first one is to identify the most important articles. Start with top performing articles based on metrics like views and conversations started and ensure they're up to date. Filter your articles by last updated to find those most likely to contain outdated information. Rati, is there anything you'd add to that? Yeah, definitely. Some of the tips and tricks I would say here is when you go to your help center, maybe look at some of the sort of top performing articles that you have. And what that means is maybe they have the most views, the most reactions. Make sure that those ones are up to date. Typically, those are the type, that's the content that your customers are going to be accessing often and that they're going to be asking questions for Fin to access. So that's one of the ways that I'd look at is going in, identifying articles and auditing them. I'd also filter as well by last updated. So find the ones that are most recently likely to contain information that is old that you'd want to update. So a mix of what's viewed the most and what's been updated probably the least and trying to see if you can update that information. Is it up to date? I would say in this one with updating content, and especially if you have a larger help center, it's a space that you wouldn't want to get stuck in as well. So update, use the 80-20 rule, update the top 20% or even less and get started by having that up to your customers and seeing how that performs and start to get tips. And so really what's showing that circle and you're going to see hear us repeat this is see this as an iterative process and not to fix everything because you'd be surprised by the time you start having your AI bought out like thin, that really starts to sharpen what areas you need to go after and, and what content you need to fix. Perfect. Thanks. So our second step is audit and update existing content. The more simple and straightforward your articles are, the better. However, disambiguation is also important. Explain special terms or acronyms the first time you use them and use full sentences instead of yes or no answers. If you have a variety of user types, include a clear reference to who the content is for. Step three is prioritize new content. See what searches yield no results in your help center and review customer conversations and saved replies to identify content gaps to fill. Ask your support and sales teams to flag important missing articles and move any customer-friendly content from internal resources into your help center. Geronimo and Declan, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this one in your experience where you're getting new content from teams and what was the process you've used for that? Yeah, we definitely um, receive, you know, being in the startup world, new content all the time and things are always kind of like evolving. So you always have to kind of really update your content a little bit more frequently. At least that's how it is for us and rebag. And it kind of goes back to the importance of uh, point number two, right? It's also like, how do you actually organize your content, right? So is your is your content really kind of grouped properly, tagged properly, organized in a way so that you really update that, manage that within its groups, I think is important. But when we talk about prioritizing new content, right? Remember, in order to really give life in the way that we look at it is that in order to really give life to Finn, right? We want to feed Finn new information all the time. Because what we do notice with our consumers, right, is, is that they come visit us all the time, right? And so the more that Finn seems fresh and, and, and is providing new data points or new information to the consumer, right, the more he really actually becomes a valued member of an extension of that team. So prioritizing new content, I think for us is actually extremely important because we just don't want the information to be stagnant and we don't want the experience to be stagnant, right? We don't want it to kind of just be the same type of things over and over, right? And so prioritizing new content is really important for us in our space. And totally agree with all the points Geronimo makes. The other one I would make is that focus in in our case, we call it our new product introduction process. So we make sure that when we're launching new products or making major changes that we really think very intentionally around the content and make sure that we are feeding the, you know, Finn the best information possible. So it'll drive the highest resolution rate when we launch those new products, new services. So be very intentional around your kind of new product and new service introduction process. And then step four is write and publish new articles. Include tables, numbered lists, and bullet points to create a streamlined, scannable structure for your help articles. This format makes it easier for AI bots like Finn and your customers to find answers quickly. Okay, step five is use templates and scalable processes. 
Templatize the various types of articles to help your team understand what good looks like and to speed up production. Build a culture of knowledge management by encouraging teams to use the knowledge base as their own support tool. Document their work and flag content that needs updating. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I mean, really look creatively at all your information sources and particularly if you have an internal knowledge base, really think about what element of that can be exposed and should be exposed to your customers, particularly in the context of Finn, being able to answer as many questions as possible. So that was a really good call that we put a lot of emphasis on really trawling through our internal help center and really understanding what information we should just be publishing out there and making available. So yeah, think creatively around all the, the sorts of information you have and what you can easily pull into your help center to drive a product like Finn. The final step, step six, is to test and improve over time. Select a specific audience segment and start to test your content over a set period of time, like at least a week. Review your resolution rates, iterate on your content, and continue to test and expand your audience size over time. Is it fair to say, Ratty, that rather than turning it on for all customers in one go, people are doing it in a phased rollout? Yeah, definitely. And I think in many ways, that's what I'd encourage everyone to think about these AI bots is almost an iterative process that you're rolling out this technology. One way is you could get stuck where you're trying to make sure that you've got a process, you've got a teammates that are trained on how to improve content, you've got all the bits and pieces, and it can seem quite overwhelming. But starting first with almost a test, identifying a group of customers that you're willing to have interact with this AI bot, and that could be a way for you to learn. That was one of the ways when we work closely with Ruth and Declan's team here at Intercom, but as well as many of our customers customers, starting with the small segment of their end users, having that AI bot ask questions and interact and identifying what the gaps are in the content, and then gradually starting to roll out to more of your end users and segments. So there's this interesting interaction where it's both giving your end users time to get used to this new interaction, this new AI bot, but also for you and your team to start refining your process on how do you identify the common questions coming in, what content do you need to improve, and you have this iterative approach of improving your processes internally to improve your content in Finn, as well as your end users starting to give you more feedback on how that interaction is working. Declan and Geronimo, any final thoughts to add on that? No, I think we cover a lot of ground there. You know, testing one is really important. One thing I would say, yeah, test, iterate, but don't be afraid to then, you know, move forward quite quickly once you've got that tuning done. Like there's definitely opportunities to move faster, much faster than I anticipated. Like I would be the conservative one saying, let's hold back a little bit. I ended up being the one saying, let's move faster. You know, so it is possible to iterate very quickly here. And I would just add, you know, back to uh, Rati's point, simplicity for us was like the ultimate sophistication. So, you know, I think at the end of the day, right, when we think about, you know, yes, this powerful tool, right, how do we actually really just actually focus on small bits and chunks, right, and then take that information, truly analyze it. And again, it's an iteration process. It's all about constantly iterating and just adding, again, that 1%, those 1% add up, right, that you end up getting closer to a finished product a lot faster than you actually think. So, so really kind of simplicity really is what, what it comes to. And it comes down to the templates, the content that you're putting in there when you're first starting off, right? The creativity will come after that. Great. Well, thank you all, Ratty, Declan and Geronimo. Thank you for listening. I think that's all super valuable advice. Okay, so that's it for today. We'll be back next week for more Inside Intercom.